Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. We had another visitor I didn't mention this morning. This is a little wilder. I was asking Andrea and Arnold if maybe there was some secret that they knew that we didn't because all of a sudden here's a baby. And it's like, wow, that's quick. And you know, it's probably about that time again for me to preach another message about children are the heritage of the Lord. Did that a couple years ago. We had six babies the next year. And uh, probably about time for that again. So, I'm getting is Kara sick today. Okay, I was just curious. So, uh, wonder if she wasn't feeling well. I had to see her. So. Uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 15 is where we begin reading. Luke 14, and we'll start reading here in verse 15. It says, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent a servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings. We thank you for each one here today. And Lord, I believe in divine appointments, and I believe this is the message you have for the hour. And Lord, you have directed us here so that we might hear from you this morning. Not from me, but from you. I pray, dear God, that you will use the Word of God because it is sharper uh, and then a two-edged sword. And, Lord, it is able to pierce uh, to our very soul. And, Lord, show us exactly what uh, you would have us to do. Father, I pray that whatever is done, that you might receive the glory and honor and that Jesus Christ might be lifted up. But, Father, I pray also if there be any in our service who is not sure of heaven is their home. Lord, maybe they've made that decision sometime in the past in their life, but they're still struggling with that. Lord, I pray that today would be the day they get it settled, that, Lord, they would understand the love of Jesus, and that, Lord, they might realize that what you want for them is not hell and the lake of fire, but you want them to be with you for all eternity. And so, Father, I pray that they will get that settled here today. And, Lord, whatever else, whatever need that is there, I pray that you might need it. Father, we ask that you take care of these things now and speak to us as only you can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I well, simply been titled this message, The Excitement of the Wedding. This is a, weddings are a great time. It's a time of uh, feasting. It's a time of celebration. Uh, it's a time where uh, a man and woman are united in holy matrimony. And this is a thrilling time here. Uh, you know, as they are gathered together at this particular uh, ceremony, Jesus is telling them about this story. Uh, this is not an actual ceremony that he's at. But he's telling the story of what takes place at a wedding ceremony. And if we go back to chapter 14, verse 1, what we find out is that Jesus is in what we would call enemy territory. He is at a Pharisee's house. They're having a meal at a Pharisee's house. And they are all, all the Pharisees and chief priests are all watching to see what Jesus is going to do. And of course the Lord knows this. And we find in verse 1 and 2, there is a man there who has a disease, something called the palsy. And uh, Jesus is uh, basically asking him a question. He says, is it lawful you know, to do good on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And uh, he knew what their answer would be. And he goes ahead and heals this man. And I'm sure they were beside himself because they had already been upset with him before about healing on the Sabbath. And then he sees what takes place here in this particular uh, feast that they're having at the Pharisee's house. And this was a common practice in the day uh, that whenever you would have guests been to your home, uh, they would have different tables set up. And 
they would oftentimes be kind of seated in, some, sometimes they had it in like a U shape so everybody could kind of see each other and talk to each other. And they would have several tables set up that way. And then the table that would be right in the middle, they would have three, in the v, in, three individuals seated on each side of the table. So it wouldn't be, wouldn't be three individuals here, three individuals here. It'd be three individuals all on the outside sitting all the way around at each table and nobody in the middle unless they had to have that. But the person who sat in the middle seat at each table, it was a, t- it was a person of honor. It was a seat of honor. But as you got closer to the middle section, that middle seat was the seat of highest honor. And Jesus is watching here as he's in the enemy territory. He's amongst a bunch of Pharisees and chief priests and other individuals. He sees what goes on. He heals this man on the Sabbath right before them, uh, right before their very eyes. And he knows what's in their heart already. And then they come in to be seated for the meal. And it's not like they have name tags like we would do probably do with a meal. Uh, you go someplace, they have a name tag. You're supposed to sit here. You're supposed to sit there. That wasn't the case. You just went in and you got your seat. And the person who was the highest honor got that chair of seat. And what Jesus observed was all of these men scrambling for these seats of honor. Uh, you know, I don't know if they were pushing and shoving or what they were doing, but, but they were trying to get into a seat of honor and recognition. And the, how, the uh, guy who hosted the meal, he would always sit at the very end table in the very end uh, because that was just what the host had done. And that's how he would uh, kind of honor all of those individuals who were to be honored at each table. So Jesus is dealing here in verses uh, 7 down through verse 11. He's dealing with these men scrambling for these seats of honor. And then he gets down into verse uh, 12 through 14 because one of the individuals that's at the meal speaks up. And it kind of sounds like he's trying to justify the host. Uh, he's trying to justify what Jesus had just condemned. Uh, he's trying to already make an excuse uh, for this guy by speaking up and says, well, I'm looking forward to, you know, when we get to heaven, we can actually sit down there at that great feast. You know, it's kind of what he says. And then Jesus, and we get into verse 15, as we get there to verse 15, Jesus is now giving us this parable. And it's going to kind of address what he just witnessed and what this man just said. And if we want to give a proper interpretation of the passage from verse 15 down to verse 24, there's only one correct interpretation of the Bible. Okay, a lot of people, have, you probably heard some people say, well, there's many interpretations and all of how you, no, no, no. That is wrong and that's a lie of the devil. Right. There's only one interpretation of the Bible. That's right. Now, if you have an interpretation and I have an interpretation and they disagree, there's one of three possibilities. One, you're wrong and I'm right. Or two, I'm wrong and you're right. Or three, we're both wrong. Mm-hmm. That's the only option. We both can't be right. There's only one correct interpretation of the Bible, and that's what we need to find. And in the passage that we read here, the correct interpretation of the passage is dealing about the loss, the importance of reaching the loss, and how God loves them. And we're going to look at that interpretation in just a second, and we'll look at a few things about it. But for those of you who have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there is also an application of this passage that I want you to make. Now, when you have a correct interpretation of the Bible, then you can make a correct application. And the application, many times you can have uh, several applications as long as you have the correct interpretation. You can make several correct applications. I had an individual one time uh, tell me that they didn't agree, uh, agree with something that I was doing. And I said, well, do you have you know, chapter and verse? Because honestly, it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what I believe. Better give me some Bible. Right. Yeah, I better have some Bible to back up what we believe, uh, because it matters what God says. That's the thing. It doesn't because we all can have a difference of opinion. But anyway, I said, when you have some Bible, they said yes, and uh, they gave me some verses, and I looked at the verses and I said, now let me explain something to you. I said, I appreciate your heart, and I appreciate the fact that, that your intentions are good, which I preached on that I think last week. I said, your intentions are good, but. You pull that verse, you pull those verses out of context, and that is not a correct interpretation of that passage. Let me explain to you why that is the case. I said if you read the verses before it and the verses after it, 
it actually explains what those verses are talking about. And that is not at all what you just said. So if you have a wrong interpretation, the application that you're trying to make is also going to be wrong. You have to correctly interpret the Bible so your application of the Scriptures can be important. And you say, Preacher, why are you saying all this? Say this. Because we're going to make, we're going to look at the correct interpretation of this passage, but we're also going to make a correct application of this passage to every believer. And it's a very important one, I think, that God has for us here. So first of all, let's look here. Uh, just three quick points. All requested. All is ready and all must respond. That's my three points. First of all, all is requested. Uh, all requested here. It says in verse 16, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Now what is he talking about? Again, we're talking about salvation. God wants every man, woman, and child to be saved. Oh, he bid me. He all were bid to come. He wants everyone to be saved. And actually, Jesus in this particular case is dealing with the children of Israel specifically because he was sent first to the Jews and then eventually to the Gentiles. But he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sometimes we look at individuals, we look at family members, uh, we look at maybe our neighbor or a co-worker or, or somebody that uh, maybe they just look like a hard case. They're beyond hope is what we sometimes think. There is nobody so far gone that God cannot reach. There is nobody so far gone that God cannot save. And that's what it's saying here. All are welcome to come. So that's the thing we have to get from that. The Bible teaches us that we are all sinners. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, that includes me, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that includes you as well. You're a whosoever. It tells us in Romans uh, 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a whosoever. Have you called upon God's name? Have you put your faith and trust in Him? The Bible teaches we are all sinners, and sin has to be paid for. Your sin can't be paid for by you. It can't be paid for by me. Uh, Elizabeth and Kyle, they uh, were in, they're in Utah, I think, right now, or maybe they were just in Utah. But they got a chance to go, uh, I guess the, the Mormons, and the Mormons, just so you know, are a cult. Uh, they are not another form of Christianity. Uh, we can, that's another message for another time. Uh, matter of fact, in the local Mormon chapter here, uh, they don't like to be called Mormons. They like to be called Latter-day Saints, but they're not saints, uh, right. according to the Word of God. And in our local chapter here, apparently, I'm not that popular. Uh, because, uh, well, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's a good thing. Uh, and it's not trying to be mean to these people. It's really not. It's trying to help them. Uh, you can go online, and thankfully we live in a time of technology. You can go online and you can do all kinds of research. There's a few Mormons uh, in the area and other places I've tried to help. And I have given them so much evidence, so much material, so many things from people who were in the church themselves and got saved, praise the Lord, got saved and came out of it. And now they're trying to help other people who are trapped in that same cult. Uh, anyway, trying to say all that to say this. They have a tabernacle there, at, uh, or I guess it's a temple, uh, it is, and uh, there at, uh, in Utah. And it's a humongous, it's a very uh, elaborate, and it's almost as glorious as any uh, Catholic church ever could be. It's so much money invested in it. And in this particular temple is where they would do marriages and weddings and baptisms and all that. And then they would have a church uh, where they would actually do their services at. But what I'm saying is they don't allow infidels, which would be you and me, they don't allow us into this particular place. But for this particular time, they did because they hadn't dedicated the building yet. So Elizabeth and Kyle got to go in with some other infidels and got to go in and... Uh, see all these things and witness this stuff. And it, it was beautiful, beautiful. Of course, they weren't, didn't allow you to take pictures and all that stuff. Uh, she very stealthily was video recording uh, with a phone by her head. And so we got to see the thing upside down <laughs> as, we, as we were going through the place. You know, 
Uh, it, was, it was a beautiful place. But you know, these people who uh, believe these things, people who uh, are in these things, they are just so deceived. But they are a whosoever. They are somebody that Jesus Christ died for. He wants to save them just like he wants to save you and wants to save me. God is no respecter of persons. He's not willing that any should perish. Uh, But they teach something, uh, and this is what I started to tell you, they teach something like this, that you can actually be baptized for a dead infidel, a dead loved one. You can be baptized for them, and they will receive the Holy Ghost and go to heaven, but you can do it on their behalf. Nowhere is that taught in the Bible. And nowhere is that even taught in their own material. That's what's crazy. It's the tradition of men. It's something that came along down through the years and it's been added to their doctrine. But it's a lie out of the pit of hell. But there's people who believe it. And then they have the thing, and I'm not saying this is all that bad, I guess, but uh, when they get married... They, the husband is given a secret name that he has for wife. So there's only a, a name that he knows. She doesn't know what the secret name is. Nobody knows what the secret name is. But when he dies and he goes to heaven, if he calls her secret name, then she also can go to heaven. If he doesn't, she's not born. Now you tell me that's not born. You think that's to try to keep her in line the whole, her whole life? That's not Bible either. <laughs> I tell you what, it's just crazy what some people believe. But I'm glad that we have a God that loves us in spite of ourselves. Amen. A God who loves us and is He died on the cross, sent His Son to this earth, who died on the cross and shed His blood to pay for your sins and my sins. Because the Bible is clear. We are all sinners. There's not a big sinner and a little sinner. We are all as an unclean thing in God's eyes. And God is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want any of us to go to hell or lake of fire. But the only reason anybody's ever going to go to hell is because they chose to go. They chose to reject Jesus Christ and his free gift of salvation. So all are requested to this way. Now I told you I was going to make an application here dealing with Christians. And I'm going to make it now. For this first point, all are requested. When God saved you, why did He save you? He saved us because He loved us. That's true. But is that it? You know, a lot of times, and many Christians have this idea that the only reason they're saved is to stay out of hell. Now, if that's what you think, you have missed it. You have missed the whole purpose of what it means to be a Christian. I want you to hold your place here and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians, chapter 2. Why did God save you? Well, staying out of hell was one reason. He paid for your sins and He loves you. That's why He did it. But there's a greater purpose. Ephesians chapter 2, this is a great passage. I'm going to read a few other verses from this passage here in just a minute. But uh, Ephesians chapter 2, we often quote verse 8 and verse 9. And I want you to look at verse 8 and 9. It talks about God, His grace, His wonderful grace. We find in verse, uh, back in verse 5, the end of verse 5, by grace are you saved. Back in verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, and I'll get to that here in just a second. It talks about God's mercy, His grace, and all these wonderful things. But verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. In other words, you can't be good enough to get saved. You can't do it on your own. You can't do anything to get saved. God, by His grace, grace is something you didn't deserve to have. Mercy is God not giving you what you deserve. You deserve hell, and I deserve hell, and God's mercy is not going to give us hell. His grace is God giving you something you didn't deserve. He gave us the ability to be saved. He gave us His Word so we could be saved. He gave His Son so we could be saved. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and it is through the faith in your heart. It's not through saying a prayer. Now, you need to call on the Lord, but God sees that faith in your heart. That's what's going to save you. It's not the baptistry. It's not church membership. It's not giving your tithes. It's not witnessing. None of those things are going to save you. Those are all works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, thus any man should boast. And we often stop right there, don't we? But look at verse 10. Verse 10 is very, 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 very important. Very important. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. works. It says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. Why did God save you? Because he wants you to work for him. And here's the wonderful thing. God knew about you. Before your great, 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 great grandfather ever thought of you, before you ever glimmer in your great, 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 great grandmother's eye, God loved you. He he ordained the fact that He wants you to be saved. Now He does not. Some people believe in this election thing that you don't have a choice in the matter. That's wrong. That's a lie out of hell too. That's right. You have a choice in this matter, and God wants all men to be saved. He doesn't want anyone to perish. But you are going to make a choice, and he knows who's going to make that choice and who's not going to make that choice. But because he created you, he created you special so he can use you for the glory of God. Why? Because there are some special things he wants to do in your life to help bring other people to Jesus Christ. God knew exactly what he needed to make in you. He knew exactly what you needed to be, whether you needed to be male or female. He knew all that, so he made you that way. He puts you in this particular area of the world, down in the southern part of West Virginia, southwestern part of Virginia. Uh, he puts you in the road County, in Catherine, puts you in this church for a reason. God wants you here because you were created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and that's why you're saved by grace through faith. It's not just to go to heaven. Right. That's a byproduct. But God wants His work to be accomplished in this world because, as Corey pointed out in the adult censor class, we have an adversary in the devil. Right. Yeah. He's trying to hinder the work of the Lord. So we need to be doing something for God. If you're saved today, that's what you need to do. And all are requested to come. There's not one person that God's going to save and say, well, I'm just going to save you and you're just, yeah, you know, I'm going to set you on the side. You're not very good. You may not be able to play the piano. You may not be able to play the guitar. You may not be able to sing. You may not be able to do a lot of things. But God wants to use you. How is he going to use you? Are you going to say yes to him? I told a story in the early service about the time when I was, uh, it was my first introduction really to youth work. Uh, down to the church in uh, South Carolina and our church down there I went to. I was in Bible college at the time. And uh, it was a pretty large church, about three, 400 people. I uh, had a big youth group and stuff. And something happened. Our youth pastor had left. And so the pastor asked me, he said, Walt, would you mind helping out and teach our children's church? I had no idea what I was getting to. I had no idea at all. I said, well, I'll, I'll be happy to do what I can. But I said, well, what do they do? He said, well, they sing some songs. Uh, you need a Bible message. Um, they'll have some game time. I thought, well, I can probably do a Bible message and game time. I can figure something out there. And, uh, you know, songs, all I knew was Jesus loved me. I didn't know much of anything else. And uh, so I thought, well, okay, we'll try to figure something out. And I go down there. I'm the only adult. There's about 60 kids from kindergarten up to sixth grade. I mean, they're like everywhere. And I'm like, what did I get into? Now, here's the rest of the story, too. That particular church, our services started at 11 o'clock. If you got out by 1.15, you were doing good. Every message was about an hour and 15 minutes. Song services went on and on and on and on. It was a long service. I didn't think about all that at the time. I go down there. I say, hey, let's, let's sing some songs, kids. Uh, who knows Jesus loves me? Well, they all know, so we sang Jesus loves me. And then I was like, uh, y'all know any other songs? And they started naming some songs. I was like there. Well, they taught me some songs. I was trying to learn the song. And they're sitting there looking like, man, this guy, he's, he's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't know anything. <clears throat> so I learned some songs, had a Bible lesson. We had some game time. And I'm looking, and I've only spent about 45 minutes. 
I'm like, well, what else do we do? Uh, well, is anybody hungry? Uh, yeah, yeah, we went in the kitchen. They had a full kitchen. And I don't know where all these hot I think God sent these hot dogs, and they multiplied somewhere. But we went in there, and we ate hot dogs galore. Uh, I hope they worked for a meal or something afterwards. But anyway, we, ate, we ate a whole bunch of hot dogs, several things of hot dogs. We ate them. I wound them up, and we had a big time. And then we still had a bunch of time to kill. So I learned I had to do some more stuff and do some more stuff. But what I'm saying all that to say is I had no clue what I was getting into. But I said yes to God. I learned so much through teaching that class. And those kids ended up loving me, and I loved them, and that relationship worked out. And we made that thing work. They taught me stuff. I taught them stuff. And, boy, we got so much Bible in them. Uh, I had Bible quizzes, Bible trivia, all kinds of stuff to get Bible in. And it was a thrill to be a part of that. But I had no idea what I was doing. So many times Christians don't get in the work of the Lord because they make some excuses. They're like, I don't know how God can use me. I can't play the piano. I can't sing. I can't do Why don't you just serve God and let Him take care of the rest? Faith was He that calleth you who also will do it. God will take care of those things, but all are requested. Secondly, all is ready. This is the excitement. In verse 17, it says, Come, for all things are now ready. What is ready? God has, and this is for the lost person, God has some things ready for you, but you're not going to get them until you come. You don't come, you don't get them. What does He have ready for you? He has joy unspeakable and full of glory. Psalm 1611, Thou will show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. He has peace ready. Isaiah 26, 3, That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. That he has love ready. Jeremiah 31, 3. I'm so thankful for this verse. Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. God's love is not conditional. It's not dependent on how you are and, and uh, whether or not how you feel. So many times people are controlled by their feelings. And, uh, you know, I know there are times in your life you're not going to feel like you love your spouse. You're not going to feel like you love other people like you should. But that's not love anyway. Love is a choice. Feelings come and go. <clears throat> Becky and I, I told this earlier, I'm going to tell it now. She's like, oh, no, what's going to happen now? <laughs> it's not a bad one. But we were such <laughs> opposites. Now, we're still opposites, but now we're a little bit more like this. We were polar opposites when we first got together. So different. And I remember her telling me one time, she's like, oh. She goes, I've never been so mad in my whole life. Nobody's ever made me this mad before. I said, well, that just proves you love me. That didn't help. <laughs> I was like, if you didn't love me, you wouldn't care. And really, that's true. We wouldn't get so worked up. We but it's when we care, that's when we get bothered. That's when we get worked up. I'm thankful God has some love that is unconditional. It's everlasting love. He has joy. He has peace. He has all these things waiting for us. He has riches. Rich in mercy. Rich in grace. The Bible tells us there in Ephesians uh, 2 4 and 2 7. God is rich in all these things. He wants to give this to you, but you have to come to Him. He's not going to force you. The offer is open. If you're here today and you're not saved, the offer is open for you to come to Jesus and put your faith and trust in Him as Savior. But you say, Preacher, how does this apply to us as Christians? Why did God save us? Remember? It wasn't just to keep us out of hell and send us to heaven, it was to work. For him. All are been come. And then also all things are ready. He has joy for you as well. More peace, more love, more of these things, more blessings he has for you and for me. If we'll just come and obey him. Too many times Christians, they're so satisfied with their life. So satisfied. But God's not satisfied with it. That we get satisfied with, well, I've got enough joy. Now I'm pretty peaceful. I don't have it. And we think, but we don't know what we're missing. We have no idea what we're missing. It is such a privilege and honor to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords to have a part in his work in this world. And he is using the local New Testament church. He's not using individuals. He's using individuals in the local New Testament church to accomplish his work in the world. That's why right. the Bible says Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's right. The church is special to him. Is it special to you? So many times it's not. Because we can take it or leave it. That's the way we act and that's the way we treat God. 
And God loves you. He has so much more for you if you would just come. Come and let Him bless you with these things. And that leads us to our last thing here. All are requested. All is made ready. But all must respond. All must respond. When I think of lost people, we're going to give you an opportunity here in a second. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, or maybe you think you might be saved, but you're just not sure, we're going to give you an opportunity to nail that down. You know, the Bible says, and it's not what I say, it's what the Bible says. The Bible says these things are written that you may know you have eternal life. That means have total confidence that you're going to heaven. And it's not based on how you feel. There's sometimes I don't feel saved. I'm a preacher. And there's sometimes I don't feel saved. But I'm glad it doesn't depend on my feelings. Right. I put my faith and trust in what God says. He's not a liar. He keeps his promises. And we're going to give you an opportunity to come, but you must respond. Nobody can force you. God's not going to force you. He's just going to make it available to you. But you know what? So many times people make excuses. Well, I'm just not ready yet, preacher. When are you going to be ready? When you take your last breath, hmm. then it's too late. Yeah. When's, that, when's that time going to come you take your last breath? Do you know? Do you have it down? You got it written somewhere? No. It's appointed and then wants to die, and after this, the judgment. You don't get a second chance. There is no reincarnation. Your doom is forever sealed. God gives you an opportunity now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Won't you put your faith and trust in Him? But we all make excuses, but Christians, the call is to you to come. All is made ready. There's so much more God has for you. Joy, peace, love, abundance, all these wonderful things he has for you. If you would just come to him and serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But what do we do? We make excuses, don't we? We see three excuses here. I just want to give them to you quickly. In this passage, we see those that are too big to come. In verse 18 it says, And they all with one consent began to make excuses. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Who buys something unseen? Sight unseen. Who buys it that way? Well, I don't know anything about it. I'm just going to buy it. I'm going to buy that land. Oh, i got to go check it out, see if it's a good deal. How foolish that is. And how foolish are excuses sound to God? I like what Preacher John uh, said a long time ago. Many of you probably remember this. Uh, he was out busy knocking on doors, and he came up to this door. And uh, he's talking to a guy, and he was trying to get him to come to church. He says, why don't you come to church? He goes, oh, I can't. He goes, why not? He said, well, I have some milk in the refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah. Preacher John's like, what? He said, yeah. He goes, what does that have to do with anything? He goes, well, one excuse is just as good as another. <laughs> I like that, because that's true. I told a guy here this past week, I said, your excuses are like armpits. We all have them, and they all stink. That's excuses. Quit making them. Christian, God is bidding you come. He has so much for you to do. So many things He wants to accomplish in your life. Why won't you come? Some people are too big to come. Well, I'm just too important. You don't know all the things I have to do. I've got to take care of this responsibility and that responsibility. I've got, I've got a house to take care of. I've got that to take care of. I've got blah, 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 blah. All that stuff. Blimey! You think God can't take that stuff away anytime He wants to? Who do you think bless you with that stuff anyway? Right. Who do you think bless you with the gifts and abilities you have anyway? God can remove it any time He wants. The Bible talks about in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, that we ought to be a living sacrifice unto God, which is our reasonable service. It's the least we can do. He died for us. He died in our place. That should have been us being crucified. Let's quit making excuses. The Bible says in Romans 12, 3, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. In Revelation chapter 3, we find a letter to the church of Laodicea. And Laodicea was not a good church. It was a carnal church. It was the church known as lukewarm. It's the one that made God sick. He vomited them out of their mouth. They didn't change their ways. And here's what he says there in verse 16 and 17. He says, thou, thou thinkest that thou art in need of nothing. You don't think you need anything. God says you make me sick because you don't realize you're blind, you're poor, you're wretched, you're naked. All of these things before him. He says, repent, or else I'll come unto thee and remove thy candlestick out of this place. God takes it very seriously. 
Let's quit making excuses. Let's not be so important to get too big for our britches that we can't be used of God. There's another group that made excuses in verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and go to prove them. I pray thee, have an excuse. This would be like the, the middle class worker here. They're too busy with their job, too busy with some project to have going around the house. Uh, this would be, matter of fact, if you go to Matthew and look at Matthew, it actually mentions a farmer. Now, farmers are busy. they got a bunch of stuff. And I know when it comes time to milk the cows, you have to kind of work when you can milk a cow, can't milk a cow. There are some things, you know, the ox gets in the ditch quite a bit when you're a farmer. But I'm here to tell you, get your priorities in order. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You want God to smile upon you and smile upon your work, smile upon your life and everything you have. You put God first in your life and all these things shall be added unto you. That's how it works. That's not just with farming. That's not just with work. That's with anything. How about your life? How about your family? You too busy? The devil uses busyness so much to keep us from doing what God wants us to do. Well, my kids have sports on Sunday afternoon, and I'm just too tired. You think I ever get tired? You think Beth and Children's Church ever gets tired? You think some of our Sunday school teachers ever get tired? We all get tired. Let us not be weary and well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That means don't quit. Keep on going. I preached this message this morning, and I thought, well, that didn't come out at all like I planned and prepared it. I don't know how it's going to come out for the 11 o'clock service. And guess what? It's not coming out the same either. But that's okay. I was sitting there in Sunday school class, and I, Corey had a great lesson. I was trying to focus, and I thought, oh, man, Lord, I am tired. I'm tired. We all get tired, but that's not an excuse not to serve God. Is that what you tell your boss at work? Oh, I can't come in today. I'm a little tired. I'm going to sleep in. Give me about 15 more minutes. Yeah, you see how long you have that job. We make excuses all the time and we think God's okay with it. <clears throat> kids have sports Sunday afternoon. I'm telling you what, what are you teaching your kids? If I, having sports on Sunday afternoon is not a problem. I mean, you want to do that? Fine. Be in church, though. What's more important? Having your, none of these kids are going to go off and play professional sports. Chances are pretty much against it, okay? There may be one, maybe in the state of West Virginia, a couple in the state of West Virginia. Not very many is going to happen. Is your child going to be that one? But every one of us, every child is going to have to stand before God someday. Yeah. What is the most important? Let's focus on those things. Some people are too busy to come. And then we see the last excuse here. Some people are too blissful to come. Verse 20, another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. She won't let me. <laughs> no, this means I'm too happy. Things are going too good. I don't have time for that. You don't understand. I only have so much time to relax. I only have so much time to spend with my family. I only have so much time for this. You know, and, and I've worked hard for this. This is my time. God can remove that any time he wants. Mm -hmm. That wife keeping you from church, he can take her away. That good thing you have, <clears throat> that boat, that car, that project, you're just so, and that hobby you're just enjoying doing so much, he can take it away any time he wants. Amen. Let's put the Lord first. Why did God save you and me? He saved us from two good works. God has a lot of things he wants done in this community. And he wants to use you and me to do it. Some people say, well, nobody asked me to do anything. Have you made yourself available? Have you said here or mine? Some people say, well, I made myself available, but it just didn't work. I think you're making another excuse. Because it might not have been God's timing. God's timing is always perfect. Put your trust in Him. Let's serve God with all of our being. Let's not make excuses anymore. Let's give Him our very best because that's what He deserves. Jesus Christ loves you. He loves me. And if you're not saved today, He wants you to come. He wants you to be saved today. Or maybe you think you prayed and you've got to take care of it. He wants you to nail it down. Drive a nail in there. And drive it deep so it doesn't move anywhere. Get it settled once and for all. The Christian, have we been making excuses? I know you have because I do too. We all do it. Over little things. 
Oh, I'm just too busy. I have time. Are my priorities in God's order? Not in my order. Are they in God's order? If my priorities are in His order, I have time to do everything He wants me to do. That's the way it works. How is it with you? Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you call us all to salvation. And you're not willing that any should perish. And thank you, Lord, that when we get saved, you've got great things in store for us. Wonderful things, not just in heaven, but things right here, right now. Joy unspeakable. Peace beyond all measure. Love that is eternal. All these wonderful things. Mercy and grace galore. But, Father, we have to come. We have to respond. Father, I don't know the need of every heart. The Lord, you do. If there's one in our service right now that maybe has been struggling with their salvation, or maybe they're just not even saved, not sure, heaven's their home. Lord, we sure would like to help them right now. With our heads bowed in the highest pillow, we just ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? I do you say, preacher, I'm just not really sure. I want to be honest with you. God knows my heart. I could not say... 100% beyond any doubt whatsoever that I've done what the Bible says what I need to do. I'm not asking you how do you feel about it. You might feel like you're saved, but have you done what the Bible says you need to do? I say, preacher, I'm just not really sure. I'm going to be honest with you. Nobody's looking around but me. Preacher, that's me. You lift your hand up real high so I can see I want to pray for you. I want to help you. Thank you. Put your hand down. I want to help you right here, right now. Anybody else? Here are some things that would help you. And you may not have raised your hand, but in your heart you did. This will help you too. The Bible says we are all sinners. It doesn't matter how many sins we've committed, we're a sinner. And because we're a sinner, we deserve God's wrath. We deserve the lake of fire. We deserve hell. But God loved us so much. He did the very best thing he could. He sent his son to this earth to die on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood. He was beaten. He was humiliated. He went through all of that for you and for me. Because he loved us. And his blood will pay for your sins. Because sins have to be paid for by blood. And your blood's tainted with sin. It can't, it can't pay for anybody's sin. But Jesus' blood was perfect. He was without sin. Without spot, without blemish. He rose from the dead the third day to prove that he really was who he said he was. He was God Almighty. Come in the flesh. And he will forgive you of your sins. He will give you a lot of these things. It starts at this first decision. But you have to pray and ask him to save you. You say, well, preacher, I've done that before. I've prayed before. Why don't you nail it down one more time? Pray a simple prayer like this. It's not the prayer that saves you, but it's the faith. God sees in your heart. Just pray a simple prayer like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell and the lake of fire. But Lord, I thank you for loving me. I don't deserve that love, but I thank you for that love. And I'm praying and I'm asking you as best I can. I'm asking you to save me from giving my sins so I can have a home in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. If you prayed that prayer right now, whether you raised your hand earlier or not, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, I wonder, would you indicate that by lifting your hand real high? See that hand? Anybody else? Lift it up real high. Now, Christian, this is for you. Are you making excuses for why you're not doing the things you should be? Or are you calling them reasons? They're just excuses to God. God knows your heart. He loves you. He wants. He created you special to do some great things. There are certain people you can reach. I can't. And He wants you to reach those people if you will only let Him use you in that way. How do you say, preacher? I know I'm saved. Praise the Lord for that. And God spoke to my heart. I know I've been making excuses for not doing the things that He's put in my heart to do. And I just, I don't know, maybe what all he wants to do. I just want to say yes to him right now and let him do some great things in my life. Is that you? Would you indicate that with your hand real high? See that many hands. God help you. God help you. Many hands. You can put them right back down. Thank you. God knows our hearts. Let's be obedient to the things he shows us. Father, 
I pray that you bless this song of invitation and help us to do business with you. And Lord, I just want to thank you again for what great love and compassion you have for us. That's an everlasting love. And that, Lord, you have so many blessings. Blessings that we just can't even comprehend. Not just when we get to heaven, but blessings right here, right now. We can have a piece of heaven here on earth. Father, I just pray you bless this invitation time. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 249. 249. We sing a few verses. God spoke to you. Won't you step out where you are and come?